Last week, someone who wants to remain anonymous came to me after the service and they said, I'm an engraver and I'm going to make commandments with the whole thing. And they did, and they brought them this week. So here they are, this is the first half. It says, I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. For those of you who weren't here last week, you can ask me after what that's all about. Thank you so much. We will hang them up. All right, the school year has already begun. But I wanted to do something a little bit special for our teachers. So here we go. So education has a purpose. And if I get, had we had the time, I would get you to give me some answers on what you think the purpose is, but we don't have time, so we're going to go ahead. There's a book our church has, it's quite old now, it's called Education. And I just grabbed a few quotes from it on the purpose of education. To restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education, the great object of life. And just two more. Every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the Creator, individuality, power to think and to do. The men in whom this power is developed are the men who bear responsibilities, who are leaders in enterprise, and who influence character. It is the work of true education to develop this power, to train the youth to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. And the last one, it is his, her, the true teacher's ambition to inspire them with principles of truth, obedience, honor, integrity, and purity. Principles that will make them a positive force for the stability and uplifting of society. He, she desires them above all else to learn life's great lesson of unselfish service. And I thought, found this, I thought it was good. A true teacher does not give information, they help form, does not just give information, they help form character. A true teacher builds up. A true teacher, a true teacher corrects for the purpose of building up. A true teacher believes in what their students can be. A true teacher inspires their students to exceed beyond the teacher. A true teacher does not just impart knowledge, they seek to develop wisdom. A true teacher makes not just better students, but better people. So I'm going to invite our teachers to come up that are here. Don't be shy. We're just going to have a prayer for you and we're going to have something to give you. Don't be shy. I know there's some here. Trudy and Rourke, if you could join us as well. Just come on up. Come on up. Come on. <laughs> We're shy. So if you could bow your heads to me, we're going to pray for our teachers. Heavenly Father, you've gifted us all to do different things in this world. But one of the most influential jobs is that of a teacher. And Father, standing before you in this church today are people that you've gifted to do just that. And every day they go into the classroom and they shape young lives. And we ask that you would give them the wisdom, the compassion, and the inspiration to do it to the best of their abilities. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go. Oh. <laughs> I did order the book Education for all my kids to buy it.
By the way, an interesting fact, one of the recognized around the world as the best education on the most education system on the most consistent basis is the country of Finland. And if you know the backstory of their education system, it's built on the principles in the book Education. Fascinating story, and other countries are now trying to mimic their system. And we've had the book and the information all along. All right. So today's lecture, I'll be your teacher, you'll be the students, is on obedience. So let me tell you a true story. My grandmother, all four foot ten of her, uh, she loved the song, Trust and Obey. I didn't like the song. <laughs> Not because the tune wasn't nice. I just didn't like that it had the word obey in it. Trust is okay, but obey, I don't like that word. At least I didn't then. Largely because I didn't understand what obedience actually is. All right, so last week I gave you a little bit of discussion time to tell me what you think obeying the truth meant. And we got a bunch of different answers of, you know, obeying rules, etc., and so forth. There was a few different things. Some of you, when you picture obedience, you may picture a bunch of different things. How many of you sent your dog to obedience school? Nobody? Must have, oh, few. How many of you think of obedience, you think of something like this? Just following the rules because... Or maybe you think of this, obeying because you have no, no choice in the matter. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that one act of obedience is better than... It's pretty powerful. <clears throat> Dictionary.com, in defining obedience, says this. It's the state or quality of being obedient. I always love definitions like that. They use the word to define itself. Really helpful. The act or practice of obeying, dutiful or submissive, compliance, military service demands obedience from its members. And then notice of the four definitions, two of them go directly to the church and to religion. A sphere of authority or jurisdiction, especially ecclesiastical, that's the church. Four, chiefly the church, conformity to a monastic rule or the authority of a religious superior, especially on the part of one who has vowed such conformance, the rule or authority that exacts such conformance. So the church says this is what you're supposed to do, and if you're obedient, that's what you... That's what you do, right? That's what dictionary.com says. How you see obedience, though, is mostly due to how you were raised. If you see obedience as positive or negative, or how you, which one of those pictures you related to, it all has to do with your upbringing, your parents, grandparents, your teachers at school, etc., and so forth. But check this out. How you see God is mostly due to how you were raised. Do you think we all have the same view of God on planet Earth? But how many gods is there? There's one. So just because we see him different doesn't make him different, does it? Doesn't, he's not schizophrenic, he doesn't have dual personalities or multiple personalities, he's one God, he's one way. But we see him differently because of what people have said to us about him, demonstrated to us about him, etc., etc., some of you, when you think of obedience, you might think of the list of, of ten, right? Some of when you think of obedience, you may think that there's a longer list. How many of you know how many rules the Jews had during Jesus? When Jesus was here on this earth, walking and talking as a young Jewish man, how many rules the Jewish church had about how to keep this day of the week? Oh. 613. Something like that. There's well over 600. Here's a smattering of them. This is from a Jewish website, so I'm not picking on them. This is, just, this is what they have out there for their own, for everyone to read. Let's start with some basic activities from which we refrain on Shabbat. Writing, erasing, and tearing. Business transactions. Driving or riding in cars or other vehicles. Shopping. Using the telephone. Turning on <clears throat> or off anything which uses electricity, including lights, radios, television, computer, air conditioners, alarm clocks, Cooking, baking, kindling a fire, gardening, grass mowing, doing laundry, and that's just the first of 613. That's a lot of oh, oh, obedience. But is it obedience to God? <clears throat> You'll find when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the tell the story of Jesus' life, that he almost all of his miracles that he performed were performed on, on Sabbath. 
which really chafed at the religious leaders because you weren't supposed to do that. And then to make matters worse, he would tell crippled people that he healed to pick up their, their mat, walk through town, and go home. He purposely chafed against the rules of the church. That was Jesus. Now our text for today sounds very religious and maybe you don't understand all the words and that's okay. I'm going to boil it down for you as quickly and simply as I can. Galatia was a city. Paul had gone there. He had introduced Jesus to them. They became believers. And then other people came in after Paul and said, well, it's not just Jesus. It's Jesus and a bunch of rules. So Paul found out what happened and he wrote back to them. And at the end of his letter, after going through a whole bunch of reasonings with him, he said this. He says, I want you to stand fast, stand firm, remain in the, in the liberty. What's that mean? Freedom. Stand fast in the liberty or freedom by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a, a yoke of bondage. Now, I'm not a priest, and I want you to confess, but I'm pretty confident that most of you have something in your life, at least one thing, that you feel guilty about. If you actually understand what Jesus did for you, is doing for you, and plans to do for you, you have no reason to carry that guilt anymore. You are free. And sadly, what religion has done is not remove the burden, which is what Jesus talked about. He said, take my yoke upon you because it's easy and it's light. Religion actually adds to your burden. It tends to. Because most people who are religious don't understand the concept of what Jesus actually did. So then he goes on, he says, Indeed I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, which is one of the religious rules they had to keep back then, Christ will profit you nothing. Isn't that interesting? Doing more makes you less. I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the... We talked about it last week. There's two ways to get to heaven. What are they? So what's the what? Say it again. All right. Either we trust God to get us there or we get there by a perfect performance record, right? This last school I was at, they had an incentive. They gave out awards at the end of the year for anyone who had perfect attendance. Does going to school every day mean you learn what you're supposed to learn? It doesn't, does it? It might improve your chances, but it doesn't mean you learn more. But as humans, we love the idea of having a certificate that says we did something. But Paul says if you want to get to heaven by a certificate of what you've done, then you, have to, you can't just do one thing or two things or a few things. You have to do everything perfectly from the beginning to the end. So verse 4, you become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the the law. I want you to think about this. I was talking to somebody this week, and uh, they wanted an illustration to explain how it is that this can be free or whatever. I said, well, think how insulting this would be if if you bought a house for somebody, paid it outright in full, signed the deed over to them, And they said, oh no, I can't accept this. I I have to do something. And they wrote you a check for $100. And they gave it to you. And then they went around boasting to everybody that they bought a new house. What would you think about that? How do you think Jesus feels when he came here? We didn't treat him right. We didn't respect him. We made fun of him. We argued with him. We spit on him. We killed him. He did all that for us. And then afterwards we say, Oh, thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us. But really, here's my, here's my list. I didn't drive my car on Sabbath. I didn't, I didn't, I did, I did. <clears throat> Verse 4. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. 
So if you choose to do some of it yourself, you've taken Jesus out of the, out of the picture. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by... There's nothing wrong with the ideal of being like Jesus. It's just a matter of which path are you going to choose to get there. Are you going to choose and trust Him, or are you going to try and do it on your, on your own? Now notice how he concludes his argument. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. See, here's what human nature does. Oh, I get it now. I don't have to keep the rules. So now I'm saved by, because I'm so smart that I know I don't need to keep the rules. Now I can show Jesus, see Jesus, I got it. I, I'm not a rule keeper. So now because I'm not a rule keeper, I'm so smart and I figured it all out, I've earned my way to heaven that way. Paul says, keeping the rules or not keeping the rules avails nothing. Because it's not about us. I shouldn't tell you this, because you might ask me to play, and I'm really not very good. But I actually went through six grades of Royal Conservatory piano and passed. I got 98% in theory and 69% in playing, and that pretty well tells you the whole story. <clears throat> my church, my little church, that you could fit two or three of them inside the sanctuary here. They actually paid for most of my piano lessons, I found out later. And uh, they wanted me, because the piano player they had was getting old, and they wanted someone to replace them. So anyways, I used to play for church, and I was always making mistakes. Drove me crazy. And then I figured out why I was making mistakes. Because every time I sat down to the piano to play, I wasn't thinking about the song. I wasn't thinking about the words. I wasn't thinking about God. I wasn't thinking about bringing Him glory. I wasn't thinking about adding to the worship service. All I was thinking about was me and how the mistakes would reflect on me and how my playing was making me look. It was all about me. And I was so consumed with me that I couldn't even play properly. I'm going to tell you a couple quick stories. Real stories, and then I'm done. Sat down with a woman once, and uh, she started to describe to me the relationship that she was in. She said, he's only happy if I'm within five pounds of a certain weight. He's only happy if the kids behave a certain way. He's only happy if his meals are a certain way. In other words, she had a very narrow band of performance in which he was happy. And if she deviated from that to the right or to the left, he was not happy at all. And it's that mindset. If we allow that mindset to be projected onto God and think that he has created this list of things that we're supposed to do, and if we deviate to the right or to the left, he's not happy. Love cannot exist in that environment. Trust cannot exist in that environment. Happiness cannot exist in that environment. It just can't. <clears throat> this week, um, somebody who's not a member here told me of some family dynamics. And... Um, Anyway, there's a boy in the, in the family who struggles to behave as he should all the time. And the father only communicates with the son when he does something wrong, and always in a negative manner. And the boy came to his mother and he said, Mom, I feel like when he's around, I'm always doing something wrong, even if I'm not doing anything wrong. How's that Santa Claus thing go? Making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty and nice. And if the people who are supposed to love you 
feel like they're running around you with a checklist to see how you're performing all the time. That is not conducive to a loving relationship. Now here's the conclusion of the matter. Paul went to Galatia, he talked to these people about Jesus and what he's really like, and they believed it. And then these other people came in and said, well, it's not that simple, it's Jesus plus, plus, plus. And Paul says in verse 7, you, past tense, ran well. Who hindered you from... from what? You see, putting ourselves where Jesus belongs, measuring ourselves with a measuring stick, using rules to define how good we are or how bad we are, all of that is putting us where Jesus belongs in his disobedience. Actually, our obsession with obedience, Paul says, is actually disobedience. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles because I want you to see this in your hands, touch it, feel it. Gospel of John, chapter 14. Still hear some pages turning. Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 15. I remember hearing this verse a lot growing up. And then I went to CUC and I learned Greek. Well, enough Greek to get in trouble. The verse says, If you love me, what's the rest say? What does that sound like? If you love me, keep my... If you love me, prove it. That's what it sounds like, right? Show me. But you know what the Greek actually says? And the more I study, the more I realize the Bible was translated by Puritans who had a certain mindset rather than actually translating what the Greek and Hebrew said. The Greek, and he, the Greek says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. One leads to the, to the other. We try and get to God through his commandments. God says, no, 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 come to me. And the rest will, will follow. That's the truth. And anything else is disobeying the truth. All right, our last song is Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. <laughs>